All right, class, so wanted to go over a couple things um, related to the exterior beams along with the girder on column line three and column line five. So last week what I did is I focused my lesson, my Zoom lesson specifically, I'm going step by step through the interior beams and we ended up determining that a 12 by 16 beam was gonna be adequate. Well, the next question that's gonna be asked is what should the size of your exterior beams be? And so one of the things that I wanna make note of for the exterior beam, and I mentioned this in the last lesson, but just wanna reiterate it, is the process is gonna be exactly the same. The only difference is gonna be that now your tributary width is gonna be half the area, um, or half the width, better said, of the prior uh, problem. Why? Because instead of covering your six eight, you're only covering one side of it. So this beam here is taking on the distributed load of the floor above it or the roof deck above it, depends what is, resting on it, but only of this half space. And that's because the interior beams are taking up the rest of it. So um, I'll make it a different color just so there's some difference. The interior beams are taking on this, this, you know, and so forth going forward. So conception is gonna be very similar. The only difference is there's gonna be less uh, tributary width, but you're gonna move about the process the same way. You're still gonna go ahead and check for you know, use the, um, the plastic modulus, the ZX, as your means of checking for the beam. You're still gonna go about checking shear, nominal shear, making sure it meets the minimum requirements, then checking against the flush in and what code allows. Uh, I'll give you a, a good thing to note is that the code allows uh, for the same, um, there's no difference uh, for the exterior and interior beams versus what code allows in terms of deflection. So you almost can save yourself a calculation there, but if you wanna go through it again, that's totally fine. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have any questions on those, move forward. But what I wanted to spend my lesson today was talking about the girders. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the girder on column line three to start. So one of the things you'll note is that the, this girder here, um, and I'll drive it here, is going from column A to column B. And so it's physically resting on a column. So what I'm going to do is, and this may not be the best drawing, but... Um, a good shape here. Okay, I'll just say um, one of them is still going to be simply supported and the other is going to be um, with still simply supported beam, one's going to be a roller, one's going to be a pin. And so what's going to happen in, honestly, the roller would probably be on the outside edge of it. So what's going to happen now is the, it's not a tributary width anymore. Instead, it's taking on this load and but it's not a tributary width and it's not a distributed load because the distributed load of the floor above it has already been displaced to the beams. Now what's gonna happen is those beams that are running horizontal are then gonna transfer their load to the girder. And so last week, one of the things I drew, and that's why I wanted to do this one to clarify this concept, was last week I drew four arrows for each of the four beams that were resting on it. Well, I also said that, well, on the column line three, there's two sides that are you know, going against it because there's beams on the left side and the right side of it. And although that's true, uh, there's something that I should make note of. So I'll just draw double arrows to note that the girder on column line three is experiencing kind of two beams on each side. So there's something that I should make note of, um, which is the fact that these, girders here, um, and let me change the color. These beams here aren't really putting their load on the girder itself. They're putting their load on the column. And that's because if, you know, the whole goal is eventually to go from, you know, roof to floor to columns to footings to ground. If the girders, the way they're attached, although they're gonna be attached to a girder potentially and potentially welded on there, their load will immediately get displaced to the column. And so these two arrows that I drew here on the ends really shouldn't be there because in all honesty, they're gonna get immediately displaced to the girder, or sorry, to the column. And so only these center loads are gonna experience on the girder, right? And so one thing I think that is important to note is that on column line three, the magnitude of each arrow is equal to 9,000 pounds. So each arrow that you could potentially draw is 9,000 pounds. And the reason for that, so th these are each P, right? So this is P, this is P, 
and this is P. So the reason for that is because when we did the previous problem, you'll note that if you take the load magnitude of, um, I think it was like 100, yeah, 50 PSF and 100 PSF, one thing that happens is when we did, when we converted that to um, PLF and then we did the end reaction forces using the shortcuts, we determined that the that the reaction force at the edge of this beam was 9,000 pounds on each side. And so that means that it inherently is placing that 9,000 pounds of reaction force against the girder. So if you're looking at column line three, the point load for each of these is 9,000. So inherently you can combine these two stacked loads and make it 18,000, 18,000. And then instead of, so now for your shortcut formulas, instead of using the shortcut formulas that you did for a distributed load, you would now use it for a situation where the point loads are equally distributed and the distance from the edge of the reaction force is um, six, eight. Yeah, six feet, eight inches, okay? So I'm kind of being very explicit here. These are things that you inherently would kind of want to figure out yourself, but because we may not, you know, be in personal contact um, every day, I just kind of wanted to be more explicit since uh, I may not get to address your questions before this is due. Um, the other thing to note is the fact that um, the common question that I always have is at the very end, uh, there's a formula that tells us that, let me get to it. Um, there's also a formula, and let me clear these annotations so they're not in the way. There's a formula in there that says, oh, it's not on this one. I know where it'd be at. Um, there's a formula that asks me to check against the, the deflection caused by the live and dead load, as well as the deflection caused by just the live load. When it was distributed load, it was really easy because um, we could just take this 50 PSF and this 100 PSF, convert them to PLF and determine the load that was on there. Um, for this one, you're just gonna have to assume that 66% of the load on the girder is gonna be for live load and then that the remaining 33% is for dead load. So when you start doing your deflection formulas, make sure you're accounting for 66% of the load being live load and 33% of the load being dead load. And I got that because there's 150 PSF total and 100 PSF is from just the floor live load. So that's two thirds of the total load. Um, so that's kind of an assumption that we have to make, um, but just wanted to throw that out there. So if you guys have questions, make sure to ask me, um, but otherwise I just wanted to do this quick little overview video of how to kind of properly approach these girder problems. All right, so if you have questions, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll have to hear from you soon.